but you heard earlier the uh, Rosemary Deemer and Joe Emerson present on the comprehensive plan. You know, Bentley's challenge is trying to align or to create an alignment between the comprehensive plan and utility infrastructure. I think it's well known that localities grow or they atrophy, so he's got quite the work. And there is, you know, a requirement of synergy, if you will, in what Mr. Chan has to do and uh, what we have as far as environmental regulations, requirements, growth, and you're going to see a proposal here that we haven't really talked about. So part of it is a new streetlight effort, but also a effort that would allow um, uh, more individuals to tap into our system. Bentley came up with both of these proposals in multiple discussions, and so we put them forward for your consideration. So Bentley. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, good afternoon. Um, the manager said it right. Uh, we are building uh, renewed, resilient, and sustainable infrastructure for today and tomorrow, looking out uh, for the future of uh, this, uh, this county. Um, to, there we go. Uh, to start us off, we'll uh, talk about uh, drinking water and our water treatment facility uh, off of Three Top and Gaskin, as well as our Cobbs Creek uh, Reservoir. And so back in uh, March of uh, 2015, uh, we went from 55 MGD capacity at this facility to 80 MGD uh, at a cost of uh, $10 million. And there is one additional um, uh, upgrade that is needed to, um, uh, to do the full build out uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the entire county. And uh, that combined with our contract with uh, the city of Richmond for water will um, uh, will supply our entire needs uh, in the uh, for the foreseeable future. And uh, part of that uh, upgrade at the facility was due in part uh, to um, uh, this board um, authorizing the construction of the Cobbs Creek Reservoir, the 1100 uh, acre, 15 billion uh, gallon um, uh, reservoir uh, in Cumberland County. And so we talked a little bit about uh, water capacity uh, this morning and the uh, the ability to uh, to serve uh, the entire county. And so with uh, with both of these uh, facilities, uh, we should be able to do that. Uh, an update for the Cal State of the World, which we're looking to uh, have substantial completion um, by the end of this calendar year. It should take us about a year to fill it. Um, and then it should be online uh, fully uh, for our use. And uh, actually, that that's a picture off of uh, one of our um, uh, drone flyovers. It's of the dam, and then in the um, in the right corner, uh, you can see the inlet outlet tower. So, will you have a? Will we have a. I don't assume we need another field trip, but will you have like a big? Drone flyover, so that we can see at some point, like the the whole thing. I'll take a field trip. We actually um, we're thinking about a work session. Oh, out because there. yes, sir. Oh. There's so much that has happened since last time you went out. We just needed to dry yeah. up a little bit. I didn't want to put that out there, but since you said we will, we'll take it. I'm fine with that. And uh, we can provide the uh, the drone uh, video uh, for your um, you and flight. Uh, moving on to the uh, the other side of um, uh, what we do, uh, wastewater and the water reclamation facility. Uh, I have given you a map uh, that is a more detailed map than uh, what is shown on the screen, and it actually takes you through the um, uh, the whole process of um, of treating wastewater, as well as identifies uh, major projects uh, that are going on. Uh, but the map you see up on the screen uh, actually shows the uh, overall age of the assets um, at the facility. And you can see that there's a fair amount in uh, in red. And the red shows 
uh, things that are uh, 30 plus years old. The blue shows things that are 20 to 30 years old. The yellow shows things that are 10 to 20 years old and the purple uh, shows things that are relatively new. Uh, uh, so under uh, under 10 years. And so we are undergoing significant reinvestment um, at this uh, facility and we are uh, rehabbing or replacing the primary clarifiers. And so those are the circular tanks uh, labeled four on the on the map. There's uh, six of them. And uh, that project, the first three that are being uh, rehabbed or replaced should be completed by April of this year. And that cost us uh, $6 million. Uh, we're doing filter maintenance. And as um, you may have heard that the filters are our, our major pinch point uh, at this facility. We are doing uh, maintenance to get the ones that we have uh, back in service. And uh, by, I guess, the middle of this year, we should have 20 of the 24 feds back in service. And uh, that should allow us to, uh, to pass through um, an increased amount of wastewater above the uh, average flow of the county. And uh, uh, that usually runs us around uh, 700,000. Uh, we're replacing our control system, our skin. 700,000 per? 700,000 700, total. Total per four uh, filter set. Um, so also we're uh, replacing our control system, our SCADA system. Uh, that should be done by the um, uh, kind of uh, fall of 2023. Uh, the big filter uh, replacement project that the board uh, just uh, awarded uh, for a $73 million, uh, that will be complete in um, uh, October of 2025. And uh, uh, there is a question out there about why we're doing filter maintenance when, we, uh, when we're going ahead and replacing them. Um, so the answer to that is that we want everything that we have currently to remain working and in good working order. And uh, in conversations with uh, the manager's office, uh, we liken it to uh, to a uh, to an old car that you have. And even though you're thinking about buying a new one, you still have to make sure that the one that you have runs. And you can't uh, you can't skimp on any of this uh, any of this maintenance. So just to put that into perspective. And we're spending seven hundred thousand dollars, but ultimately the replacement cost of the filters is what seven seventy three million seventy three million dollars. So, um, but at the end of the day, what you have here is you have a it's a plant, right? I mean, it's a factory that ultimately you have largely retooled. And the truck scale when you say truck scale replacement. Are those the, the trucks that um, that that use the biosolids? They come in and pick up the biosolids and then drive off and use them on farmland. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. so that that's where they come in and out, right there. Yes, ma'am. And also, um, when we accept uh, truck hauled waste uh, from uh, people to truck hauled uh, waste, right? To, uh, from our uh, septic, septic system. system. Um, How much uh, do they the... have to pay for that? I'm just curious. Yes, ma'am. You know how much they pay for pumping out a truck? Just, I mean, how... I don't. I I can find that out. I I don't have that um, uh, offhand. Um, uh, but I know that it it is. Um, they pay per gallon to bring it to us for us to treat it. Okay. Just curious because you know we're we're working on getting rid of septic systems, and I'm just curious how much it costs. About a hundred and seventy five dollars to pump out a. Sort of a standard. It's going up. It's almost $300 now. $300. <laughs> <laughs> it's curious. I mean, because I'm sure part of the fund, the money is based on what we charge for them to dump it. So, okay. Thank yes, you. And I will say that uh, we are our major uh, reinvestment in this uh, facility uh, will total uh, $100 million in this uh, project. Um, so these are uh, yeah. um, these are some pictures of the skater replacement moving from left to right. 
um, clarifiers and uh, the filters. And I am um, happy to report that the first of the three clarifiers that we are replacing uh, went into service on Thursday. Now, um, as part of the uh, 2026 uh, comprehensive plan, uh, this graphic was um, uh, was uh, was put together uh, showing the uh, major expansions um, over the years to get to the ultimate build out of this facility, uh, which was uh, about 135 MGD, uh, looking at a population of uh, over uh, 530,000 um, uh, residents in the county. And we had originally thought that in the uh, kind of late 2030s, early 2040s, uh, we would have to upgrade the facility from a 75 MGD uh, uh, to, uh, to 90 MGD. Uh, but based on everything that we've seen with um, uh, conservation and green space, as well as um, uh, denser development and uh, wet weather flows, all of that information is is going into our um, facility study to look at and also plan uh, when these uh, next uh, upgrade or expansion phases uh, need to happen. And so uh, we did have a uh, we did have a presentation about the comprehensive plan, and uh, we will touch on that um, in the um, uh, further along in this uh, in this presentation. And when we looked at the um, the expansion of this uh, facility, we we had originally estimated uh, five dollars uh, per gallon. Uh, so every for every additional gallon that you wanted to be able to treat at this uh, facility, it would cost you five dollars. But that was like ten years ago, so we're estimating that uh, would have doubled by now. So uh, ten dollars uh, uh, per gallon. So uh, to do a lot of the upgrades to get you to one. 135. We're thinking that uh, it, it may be north of 100 million to uh, to do so, but it's not a uh, a tomorrow thing. Uh, it, but it is something that we are um, uh, planning for and setting major uh, milestones to uh, to get to. Uh, moving on, uh, our 10-year uh, capital improvement plan uh, is estimated at. Six hundred million dollars, and uh, again, we are uh, we are reinvesting uh, in this uh, in these uh, systems because they have to last. And so that's uh, fifteen water projects at one hundred fourteen million, and twenty nine uh, fuel projects at uh, four hundred eighty four million dollars. And I will say that. We are looking at our business as well as our CIP a lot differently and a lot differently than we ever have. And we recognize that this can all be on our rate payers. And there's a better way to, um, uh, to solve the problem to, uh, to thread that needle. Um, and so we're not looking at just one source of funding. And uh, this board has authorized us to pursue a grant funding uh, from FEMA grant funding and from other sources, and uh, we are looking at that to uh, to get ahead um, of of our needs as and and to be able to meet these other projects in the CIP pool. Mr. Chan, how old is the reclamation facility now? So, uh, 1989. Um, one of the big components that uh, we are looking at, and we spoke about it earlier, is um, is resiliency, uh, because we know climate change is is a very real thing uh, that uh, everybody is uh, is experiencing. So uh, we're we're seeing uh, more wet weather, uh, more intense storms, more frequently, and part of our um, our approach to that. Is uh, what we're calling wet weather in system storage, and and so we're looking at uh, building uh, FEBs or flow equalization basins uh, and flow equalization pipelines 
a proposed discipline to pace it out uh, so that it doesn't overwhelm any of our systems or the uh, reclamation facility. And so currently we have 22 million gallons of in-system storage, and we hope to be able to, um, to have what is the average daily flow of the entire county, which is about 40 to 45 uh, a million gallons. And so I say this as a, um, because part of what we've been able to do is that in 2018 and 2020, we had similar uh, rainfall amounts of uh, over uh, 60 inches. And we were able to, from 2018 to 2020, reduce our overflow volume by 90% uh, through efforts uh, like this, better management and, and putting the right infrastructure in place to, uh, to help manage uh, what we're seeing uh, in the environment and uh, in the system. So all of this uh, comes together in the, uh, in the facilities plan, the water and sewer facilities plan uh, that is tied very closely to a uh, planning uh, comprehensive plan. They're kind of, they're on parallel tracks. And where we want to be, and uh, uh, this is, um, uh, this is uh, a common goal between, uh, uh, amongst the board, is that we want everything in the can so that's uh, everything that's on well and septic uh, to be ultimately served by uh, county water and uh, county sewer. And so this plan takes into account, uh, again, comprehensive uh, coordination with the comprehensive plan, uh, population growth factors, land, um, as well as uh, wet weather flow management, which we just talked about, uh, elimination of um, as best possible of sanitary sewer overflows, and then um, also looking at a redevelopment of um, areas of the county and a high density of development. Um, so moving on to uh, to to, um, to infill. Uh, so taking care of those. Uh, well and septic systems. Uh, this is a, a map the board has has seen before. Um, I'm happy to report that we've um, pulled the trigger on uh, the Greenwood Road area project. We've assigned that to our uh, annual engineer. So that's uh, uh, underway. Um, and uh, we hope to be able to take offline 19 well systems and 460 uh, septic systems. And uh, this is all uh, the thing that really kicked this off was the uh, Rock Springs um, project, uh, which I'm happy to report uh, will be at the board in in March for award. Um, we've also um, uh, cut loose the Pouncy Track West project, uh, otherwise known as the uh, Pepper Hill Creek uh, Field project, and uh, this uh, takes offline. Uh, several private pump stations and uh, 45 uh, septic systems. And now that we are underway on these two, uh, we are moving on to uh, uh, Bruin Hill. Um, a long time coming for, uh, for this project, as well as uh, Hanover Road and Graves Road. And uh, this is a, um, this is one the, the board hasn't seen yet. Uh, so Brooking Meadow Drive uh, near Creighton Road and Cedar Forest Road. You, can, oh, yes, sir. Um, I, your, your terminology just then, we're underway in regards to uh, Greenwood Road and County Crack. Yes. When you say you're underway, what are you saying? Under, under design? So, we are uh, we are serving for design. So we're it, it's it started the process. We're not laying sewer though. Not yet. Okay. And uh, one thing about uh, the Pouch Track West uh, Tuckahoe Creek um, Trunk Sewer is that all the letters uh, went out to residents about survey, um, and we hope to have some community meetings um, uh, to inform them of the progress. 
have how much time to spend this money? Uh, so like five or six years. I just spent $64 million. This is the federal money. Coming back to the Brooking Meadow Drive um, project. Uh, so this doesn't actually take offline any well or septic systems, but this is a uh, proper uh, chip project with uh, Henrico schools. Uh, to put sewer in an area where uh, students uh, in the career and technical education program are building houses. Uh, so there's going to be uh, eight houses on that on that lot on the map, uh, all served by a county sewer. And we hope to involve them in the design process, the uh, uh, the construction um, inspection and uh, management uh, process, and and we hope. That this will be a, uh, a good learning experience for the students. Mr. Manager, this is Philip Parker's group. Say again. Um, Booking Meadow Drive. I'm not you, you said kids building houses. Is yes, that? So it is Philip Parker. Uh, Philip Parker's. Um, that program. And then we also have uh, Corridon Road in, in Fairfield with uh, 44 septic systems and uh, one place. Um, so this is, and, and pause here maybe because I want to make sure the board, if there aren't any questions, the premise here is that you had development that occurred around septic. And what you're doing first is you're going in and capturing that development to tie into the system. Yes, sir. So areas that have been left behind essentially. So um uh we'll say that uh kind of all around uh is they're they're served by county water uh county sewer um but through um some possible missteps in, in development uh these areas are served by well receptors and we want to be able to uh, universally provides uh, those services for these So um, I put this uh, image of uh, backup um, showing the uh, service responsibility uh, for an individual homeowner. So everything uh, kind of from the property line out into the street, uh, we maintain, uh, but everything uh, from the property line back up to the house, the homeowner maintains. And so there is a question about, well, if we put water and, and sewer in the street, how does a resident uh, connect? And the normal process is they would engage a, um, a plumber and uh, uh, that plumber would help them uh, uh, take the, um, the well and septic system offline and then run the lines all the way out to uh, the front property line. And we recognize that that is um, oftentimes a, a difficult task uh, for someone who uh, doesn't do this on a daily basis. And, and so one of the thoughts is, a, uh, is an annual contract, much like the turnkey contract that the, uh, that the board authorized for bulky waste, where it's a pass through and it's a county contract, but the uh, the homeowner would would call in and it'd be a pass through to that co plumbing contractor and they would assist the, uh, the resident in making those connections at a, a reduced price. And so we spoke about the on site. Uh, Coming through a contract, uh, but we didn't speak about the uh, our connection fees uh, for water and, and sewer. And so currently, uh, if you were to come off of a well or a septic system, uh, that would uh, cost you around uh, $11,000, uh, $5,185 for water, $6,255 for sewer. And so we hope to be able to uh, utilize, and this is a policy question for the board, utilize uh, some of the um, uh, credits that the 
that the county has earned in, um, I believe uh, the bulk of it was earned in the uh, extension of uh, water and sewer to serve the uh, Elko uh, Middle School. And so those credits are valued at 4.2 million. And, and so the, the question for the board is, uh, the use of those credits to offset the sewer connection fees uh, for uh, homeowners. And now there are uh, some slight uh, changes uh, to, the, uh, to the code that would allow for that. And, and so offsetting uh, those, uh, those uh, connection fees, uh, but also the uh, sense we are doing the water and uh, sewer extension uh, through the, uh, the use of ARPA funds, uh, federal funds, uh, we estimate the total benefit uh, to a homeowner uh, to be around uh, twenty thousand hundred dollars. And and so if you look at the uh, bottom of the slide, um, we talked about the procurement of an on-site plumbing contract, the use of uh, county sewer credits to offset uh, the connection fees for homeowners, um, and the last thing was the creation of an ongoing uh, funding source for these uh, infill and development projects. And now we know that we are fund uh, funds limited uh, with the um, with the federal ARPA funds. And I will say that uh, the board did authorize a five percent uh, increase on connection fees, uh, which we are. Uh, after this year, we will currently uh, hold back in a reserve fund uh, to help with these um, these ongoing infill and development projects because we know um, overall the, the the goal is to get services uh, to the entire county, and we estimate that our reserve fund uh, to be about uh, anywhere from uh, five hundred thousand to a million uh, a year, and so. We hope to hold that back and let it build over time so that uh, we can tackle uh, things like uh, Tree Hill or Wilton and uh, what we're going to talk about next, uh, the uh, water extension into the uh, Sandstead area. And this is where, with your annual budget proposals, you can actually um, also have the general fund augment any of these efforts. It'd be a policy decision of the board. We're not talking about significant amounts of money on an annual basis, half a million dollars to a million on the side. Let's say the general fund kicked in another half a million dollars. What you would be able to do, though, is incrementally and over time get to all of the all of the septic and be able to extend water as far as you possibly can. You know, it would have to make sense. You'd have to have concentrations of development. But I think you could pretty much cover most of the county taking this approach. But you couldn't do it without six to two million dollars. And so Bentley's proposal, I think, has several board touch points. Number one, Tom, they would have to, the board would have to approve the annual contract, right? For the and so what we're talking about is the county coming in and procuring services and saying we want to hire uh, you know, XYZ plumbing company or XYZ company, and, and they have given us a rate of this much per linear foot to be able to connect to the house to the sewer. Uh, number two, you would have to do something to absolve the $4.2 million worth of connection fees. You're not talking about permanent connection fees, you're talking about only for this effort, this program, fixed amount for these areas. Yes, sir. And it would be time limited to the project. So it wouldn't go forever and ever. So I would see, um, uh, I guess the last uh, um, a shovel of dirt goes in or the road gets paid and the project is um, fully completed, then, then that, um, I guess, uh, uh, that is sunset for the, uh, for the homeowners. They wouldn't be able to uh, utilize it waiver for that credit. So the annual contractor would be paid by who? By the citizen. Who just set up an ideal for them. It's basically and what that last connection to come issue. Yes, sir. And from the main to their property line, they use this or not use it if they don't want it. 
they could use the spell tracker to connect to their house right. or they get their own. And we want to make it as simple as possible for a homeowner to, uh, to connect up to these services. So we provide the main infrastructure, the main line, the connection to the property at no cost to the homeowner utilizing these dollars. Right. We award an annual contractor, which costs us nothing other than using the leverage of the volume to get a good rate. And we offer them as a, as a first viable option. And then the $4.2 million would go towards what? The, the uh, four point two million dollars would go to offsetting the uh, the connection fees uh, for homeowners. So we're going to waive the connection fee, but we're going to they're going to use hopefully our annual contract to install. Yes. So we're not installing and waiving the fee at our cost. No, sir. Good. So they they still have a, a portion. Um, uh, for them to do, which is the connection from the house out into the property line. Thank you. What was the figure that um, the benefit of the assessment of the home when they get connected to county water and sewer? Do you? I think you have that calculation. I do. I don't have it on me. Okay. Um, uh, but we do have that, and that would be an increase to the overall overall value of the property. That is. That is served by county water and sewer versus a well and septic. Venture. Seeing here. You're going to reduce the connection fee or eliminate eliminate it for okay. yes, ma'am. Just for just for this sixty-two million dollars worth of work extensions if you will. okay because we we want it makes no sense to run the you know the sewer pipe down the street and not have folks connect to it okay sorry I was right. the portion of the connection fee between the main and their property line yes they still have to pay property line to the community to yes sir but they get the benefit of the county going out for an annual bid and getting multiple bidders taking the lowest bid because it's all would be based on a Lynn that's Lynn right. foot. Who's a company that potentially give me give me two companies that would bid on this? Uh say like a semi light or a uh, they, they they would be uh, uh they would they would have the ability. GL Howard. GL Howard. Although GL Howard GL would Howard be. would be bidding on the the big trunk, not small stuff. Yeah, they're 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 big sewer, not little. He's Bentley's right. Plumber, a plumbing company does little backhoe. It's a PVC pipe. Bang. Yeah, that's a good subject. <laughs> well, I don't know, Pat. <laughs> so um, we would actually put that. Uh, I put that in the contract, and so there would be a contract price for any uh, concrete work that needs to be uh, uh, taken out. Have to dig it up. Yes. Yeah. I'm just saying. Anyway, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And, uh, so I did want to, uh, uh, for one last time, point out this uh, water and sewer extension. So if you were a homeowner just coming in and we didn't have this program and you were around uh, like 300 feet away from the nearest uh, sewer and, and you said, hey, I don't like my, um, my septic system, I don't like my well, I'd like to connect up. You actually pay a per foot uh, extension cost to us to extend those facilities uh, to the front of your house. And so we do estimate uh, an individual benefit um, of uh, around ten thousand dollars to ninety two hundred dollars uh, for uh, each resident who would uh, decide to uh, do this. Um, so we we spoke a little bit about um, water extension uh, into the Sandston area. Um, I do have an update uh, for you uh, for PFAS and sampling and testing. Uh, we have received almost 200 of the 260 uh, results, and I'm happy to report that 
the majority of the results are non detect because uh, we're not finding that in the uh, the sampling of the low water. Some of the ones that uh, we have found some PFOS in, I think, are uh, well below the uh, EPA draft guidance uh, for PFOS. So, just to be clear, because I know, uh, Mr. Nelson, you're going to get questions. The, the non detect, well, what is at what level? Is PFAS a problem? Uh, 70 parts per trillion, as uh, stated by uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. So, and when you say non detect, the majority, are you talking 30, 40, 50 parts per trillion, or are you talking 5, 10? So, it is, I uh, said so the non detect accounts for about 90% of the uh, results that are in, uh, shows uh, it is so low that the instruments at the lab cannot detect it. When are, when are, we've been talking about letters, right? I mean, Mr. Nelson, when are we sending those letters out? Uh, so this coming week. Um, we finalized the draft on Friday and uh, we'll be printing them uh, on Monday. So you feel, you feel good now? I feel a lot better than I did in um, the real, you know, November. Yeah. <laughs> so you can breathe a little bit now. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> so we're going to put, um, put letters on the mail this week. Yes, sir. And how many people? Uh, so uh, the first batch will be about 170. And then we'll, we'll just continue to send them out as the uh, results get validated by our environmental consultant. Are you getting more, um, are you still getting people? Uh, morning, yes, sir. Morning, we have been well tested. Yes, sir, we are. And then, uh, so we're thinking about a, a second round just to, uh, to capture everybody who so, wants to come in. So. so what I would assume and hope, well, I would think that once the letters start going out and people start to see that everything is good, they may start, hopefully they'll start sharing that stuff with their, um, you know, Hopefully they'll um, start sharing that stuff with um, um, with their neighbors. But based upon what you just said, we're sending out letters to people saying, "Hey man, this is this is looking looking good for the rest of this." Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Right, thank you. Um, and, uh, but, I'm sorry. I mean, that's the most you said. Like, you've been trying, I'm trying to get uh, Billy to say something. Billy would, Billy would not double down on anything I said. Just, you know. But now, okay, good. Billy. So now I can breathe too. Uh, yes, sir. And, yes, sir. Um, it is, uh, it is a, um, very good news uh, for all of us, uh, knock on wood. Uh, we hope that uh, continues uh, for the rest of the uh, of the sample and any second round samplings uh, samples uh, that we do. Um, but so, I will, Mr. Mr. Manager, real quickly for you. Again, this was we didn't cause this, but yet we stepped up to try to make sure that our citizens were um, that we got the answers for them. Yes, yeah, so right? there have been uh, other, and, and we took care of the cost. Yes, sir. I mean, we took care of the cost and we went beyond the area, right? I mean, we had folks that said, you know, I live across the street or I live down the street. And we, and Bentley was clear. Do you have a worry? We'll test it. Is this the mayor? So there's a surface water PFAS in the White Oak Swamp. Uh, I think some other locale, another locality has known it, Newport News, for two years. You've had, uh, I think, some state agencies involved in um, watching that, but what's really uh, disturbing to me is that the federal government has known about, or the Department of Defense has known about EFOS um, at its facility for they years. Sent them, they, sent out, but they sent out, actually, actually they sent letters out yeah. to, to residents in Sandston at the beginning of last year about EFOS. Okay. Yeah. So he got it the middle of October. We were, we were notified what? One um, evening? Yeah, I think like the 25th of October. It was like at uh, 9.30, uh, 10 p.m. after uh, everyone had gotten home from board meeting. Yeah. 
we had a state agency that basically wanted to send out, I won't name who, a news release basically for, you know, I guess covering an approach that they took or didn't take. And we said, absolutely not. We want to go in and see what the issue is because, you know, this was reminiscent of what could have, what happened in uh, Michigan. You know, so the, the, the story is that there, there seems to be surface water PFAS. It does not appear to be in any of the wells, whether they're shallow wells or deep wells. So this was a chemical required by the federal government to take care of anything burning that happened at the airport. Oh, and right. they required its use. Every year, the airport was required by the federal government to test the equipment. And then they turn around and criticize us for having it. <laughs> Sorry. And then the county and every, you know, the airport, the county and everybody is now being told you have to clean it up. And what you're saying is it's not bad or it's not as bad as you thought. Correct. And, and so the, they, when the airport tested it, they tried to keep it confined. So apparently they did well enough. So that's what it tells me. Right. Um, so I, you, you can't uh, necessarily speak to uh, any of the uh, activities uh, of, uh, recently by the airport, um, but we were made aware of this uh, because there was a study by uh, Newport News Waterworks who, who used it to take the Hawaii River as a source of water. And so they kept on going further and further upstream until they reached the airport area uh, where there were uh, significant levels of Two compounds, PFOA, uh, PFOA, and PFOS, PFOS, which um, together they it, it, it is uh, the PFOS uh, compound. And uh, so there was a, a fear that it had uh, infiltrated um, uh, through and into the groundwater, uh, possibly affecting wells. And uh, like the manager said, um, we received this at the 11th hour and, and um, uh, through um, uh, Manager's office uh, uh, efforts, as well as the efforts of this uh, board, uh, we were able to stand um, uh, stand up for a trial uh, very, very quickly. I uh, validated those findings in the month of November, uh, completed all of the sampling of the wells, all uh, 260 in the month of December, and uh, uh, started receiving results uh, kind of at the end of December. Uh, and, earlier this month, but we wanted to take it one step further because uh, we are not the experts on PFAS, and so we engaged uh, Mark McLennan Agency, an uh, environmental consultant, uh, to help us review the information. So that's, that's, that's what I was going to ask you, so that's validated lab outside of us? Yes, sir. So validated lab, validated measures, right? Yes. And so they know all about the testing sensitivities and all of that stuff. So that's why we, this is not an in-home thing. We went to a validated source. Correct. Okay. And um, so the lab that we used uh, is Enthalpy. And uh, their, their lab is like the lab that does all of the PFOS sampling. And I think they do PFOS sampling uh, throughout the, uh, the East Coast. Um, they're based in Wilmington, North Carolina. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we put that in the letter? Do we need to go to that level of information? We don't. Um, but I do feel like people will ask about where we did the testing and all of that. So I think just internally, I, I probably need to know where, just in case I start getting that type of question. You know, you would want to know, right? Right. I mean, so let's do this. You have a drag on next week, Monday. If you would sit down with Mr. Nelson and I, just to go through the, what the letter looks like, because I, I I know, Tom, you all have looked at it, but I also want to make sure that from a, you know, from an average resident standpoint, I mean, that's a very good point. The letter, the letter. Yeah. So, so it's got all of that. On the, on the actual testing. Okay. I think Shepard has reviewed the letter as well. Perfect. So if you can, Monday, let's just sit down when we have an opportunity with Mr. Nelson. And, and I will say that the letter is three pages. Uh, they 
a short letter uh, telling you what the results are, and then two pages of a detailed uh, result uh, okay. from the lab. Good. Let's get them out. Hey, it's one more thing. Huh. So if the folks in, you said it was Chesapeake? I mean, who was it that found it? But you didn't find it in the area? Or it just didn't in the wells. It's not the wells. It's not in the wells, so it didn't seep in. Correct. Right. This is a phone that may get used in the future. So, uh, if, if they um, so they stopped using that particular phone, um, and and so there is a new suite of chemicals that have replaced it. Hopefully, all um, uh, safe to uh, to everyone. Um, but the, the particular ones in question that. Uh, may be harmful to uh, uh, to, uh, to people that have been discontinued. They found it in the Chickamauga. Uh, they yes, did they. find it in the Chickamauga. They did, oh. uh, but at lower levels, and uh, when they got up to the uh, 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 the White Oak Swamp Street area, that's where they found the highest level. Okay. Thank you. Um. So I will say that. Uh, while there is currently good news on the on the PFAS uh, front, it doesn't stop us from uh, planning. As you all know, um, I like a I like a good plan and uh, <laughs> like some contingency plans uh, as well. Um, so this map shows our uh, water extensions and uh, our um, our initiative to. Uh, to get all of the uh, White Oak Swamp Creek uh, Basin area uh, served by county water. Uh, it will take 40 miles of water mains uh, to do so at a cost of 80 million. And, and we think that uh, we can uh, program that in strategically to, uh, to make it happen. Um, and the, uh, the last thing uh, that I have for you is a discussion about uh, street lighting outside of uh, sanitary districts. Uh, you heard a lot about a uh, transportation and, and a bike plan, and you want to be able to make all streets uh, safe uh, for residents, whether they're, they're driving, walking, or biking. And, and so we're trying to, uh, uh, we're proposing an empirical process uh, that takes data from public works uh, uh, accident and crash data, as well as uh, police data, uh, to put together a um, an initiative uh, to reduce uh, injuries uh, during the night um, for, uh, uh, for crashes uh, for, um, involving cars and uh, walkers and uh, and bikers, and and so uh, the policy question that we have uh, for the board. Uh, today is uh, whether there's um, there is a there is a desire uh, to set uh, something like this up uh, through some ongoing funding uh, that will put um, street lights in strategic areas uh, to reduce uh, injuries. What do you call strategic areas? What's that definition? Uh, so areas as determined by the. Um, by analyzing data, uh, accident data uh, that Public Works has and uh, and um, uh, police has. This would be like intersections to block the accidents that don't currently have any sort of light in them. Yes, and and we think that um, uh, public utilities uh, can uh, can help with the uh, uh, standing up the capital piece of it and. Uh, the ongoing maintenance uh, can be run through uh, public works. So this would be it's on signal pole. So this would likely not be. It, there's a bubble map, if you will, of pedestrian pedestrian accidents that we have. If you follow that, what you'll find is that you have unlit portions of straight of of state streets. These are state facilities. Think of Staples Mill Road right down the street, right before you get on the interstate. And we've had multiple accidents there, so that would pop up. What it wouldn't be is, you know, a, a subdivision or a, a, a dark subdivision that 
you know, um, if someone comes and says, you know, this cul-de-sac I'm worried about. So it would be based on traffic crash data. And we can bring that, that model back to the board and show you what that would look like. But it would not be, he's not talking about a countywide streetlight program. He's talking about in these areas. Hot we, spots. We, yes, hot spots. Is there Thank you. Electric driven? Are they so other just technology exists yet? Can stand those white folks collect solar energy during the day and shut it down at night? So, so there's a combination of things uh, that can be done. So uh, it doesn't, I won't necessarily speak for Dominion's capabilities, but from what we've seen, it's very easy to uh, to put up a um, uh, an electric pole uh, if there's electricity in the area, and then put a light on it. It's time to try to use it. Well, that as well as on traffic signals. And the signal pole, but you'd have to take down the whole pole, wouldn't you? And have to put up because the, the there's some that have a light that goes at the top, and then you have the signal arm with the red and green lights on it. And, um, but, but that's a whole new pole. I don't think you can just stick it on the top of a regular pole. Well, but, so it would be. That, I know, it, well, I'm seeing here, it looks like they're intersections. I see one on Patterson. And that is, a, it, I'm pretty sure I know where that is. That's a dark intersection. Not so much around, but there's going to be something there soon, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a case coming in zoning. But um, you're saying add the signal arm at the top of the signal arm to light up the entire intersection. Yes, I think that's yeah. a good idea. And I think I'm getting a text here from Steve Yab um, reminding me the county signals already have the lights. Okay. <laughs> yes, the V dot signals do not. Oh, okay. So that's. Tell Steve, come over here and join I, us. For the Steve, I can add can you turn him on. I was going to say, I can add him to the website. Yes, because Patterson is staying. He's, a, he's less than 100 yards from us. <laughs> Patterson is staying at six, so that's exactly right. That makes perfect sense. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that, that Mr. Manager is exactly correct. The uh, VDOT signals are largely without these luminaires that we put on all of our signals. So we would be retrofitting them as well as using the electrical feeds near the signals to add um, lights to this. And if I may, this is a uh, what they call a uh, proven safety countermeasure that FHWA is promoting is lighting up these hot spots of pedestrian and vehicle accidents, and that has shown to be greatly uh, beneficial to safety. Thank you. That's exactly Patterson Avenue, State Route okay. 6. So see, why can't we get the state to do it? <laughs> why can't we get the state to put the light on the signal arm? Why do we have the light? That, that's a great question, ma'am. We'd love to get the state to do everything, but. Yeah. <laughs> So when the juvenile judges come in with the budget and say, you know, we want you to give us a supplement, All that's right. the same question. Okay. And it's, I think, I mean, we keep having these accidents and you've got more and more pedestrians. We have the ability to, to Mr. Brandon's point, hit these hot spots. Are those look like there's some on Broad Street too. And again, it's a state. Okay. A lot on Broad Street, ma'am, a lot. And uh, just to uh, sum up, um, uh, the questions that we've been before the board today are about the cre creation of the ongoing funding for infill and development projects, uh, the use of county sewer credits uh, for offsetting sewer connections used for homeowners, the procurement of an on-site plumbing contract to assist homeowners, and um, the possible creation of a streetlight program uh, outside of sanitary wastewater. And be happy to answer any um, questions that you may have. Okay, so Mr. Chan, I'd like to say to you personally, <clears throat> um, since um, public utilities has been under your aegis and stewardship that you have been, this department been extremely responsive. And so I just want to compliment you 
and your staff for that. And I've also noticed that with uh, Public Works. Mr. Manager, what I want to broach a detail on this as Mr. Dan is concluding uh, two things, if I may. Number one, uh, I'm one of the board members, and could be others, that I came from a district, I came from a locality, like so every corner. Mm. And so my my cultural adjustment to Rico County was, my gosh, once I turned out the car lights, I didn't realize it was so dark. And so then I started asking more questions. I found a very archaic term that we can have lights, uh, but we have to use the facility called, what is that they call? Sanitary district. And so I just wanted to add one other thing to this, but we've come a long ways. Yeah, I'm glad we talk about water. And most of Mr. Chad presentation has been about water plus other things. Um, right off of, of Mechanicsville, in the, I think we call this area of Central Gardens. There is an irate citizen, probably a group, and I don't think it's anybody's fault. This is time, but they purchased these homes. And water is going everywhere. Water is going everywhere. And one of the, one of my constituents won't even talk to me. Said she said, "Don't even call me up. Don't have anybody call me up until you have the answer." So my plea to you is, maybe in the future, could we get some type of um, county agent in the future to look into situations where we have housing. But they have really had a type of water related problems. And this lady just last week sent me a whole list of uh, pictures for the inside of her house. And so when I and others kind of people try to help, she won't talk to us. So I'm thinking there are other persons, and what probably happened over those years, those homes where she resides, probably about 40, 30 years of age. And I think the topography has changed. It has affected some of their homes. But they don't see the, they don't know what to do. And, and we don't know how to assist them. That's the area I think we need to take a look at it for the future. I would be appreciative if you would do that. Absolutely. So that's a takeaway. I'll come back to you um, with something specific on that. It is isn't drainage. I mean, it an outside drainage or something like we have all those well, it's a combination of outside drainage and the residents now feeling that this is something that's impacting the structure of the house yeah let me look at it mr bennett i'm not familiar with it it could be changes in the water table i'm not sure um i think mr hughes was going to give us some information on the street light program is mr hughes online Hey, uh, Mr. Hughes. Can can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, I had some information. Um, uh, just in general. Um, we we do work with VDOT as far as the street lights. Um, they do have a lot of their intersections don't have the the luminaire arm that you mentioned, and that is an issue. Um, we're trying to work on, uh. You know, if there's some low cost ways to do it, um, but right now the primary way they're adding those lights is to uh, replace the entire signal, which they're seeing in costs running in the 750,000 plus range um, to replace signal. So it, it, it can be kind of pricey. So what, what Bentley was talking about was trying to leverage maybe some opportunities with Dominion at, you know, at these dark intersections on the, the spot corridors. Where for a lower cost, we can maybe leverage an existing dominion pole um, in the interim um, to provide some of that some of that spotlighting at a uh, at a value cost. And um, you know, we're seeing some upticks. Uh, like in 2020, we saw you know fairly high amount of pedestrian fatalities. Most of them happened at night. Uh, over two thirds, we had eight. And last year in 2021, um, the latest number from police is we had 14. So we went from eight to 14. So um, so that's just kind of pointing out um, there is a uh, what I would say is a systemic issue. It's not just one area. Um, so, you know, just in looking at some potential solutions, that's where I think, you know, in talking with Bentley, there may, 
there may be there may be an opportunity for us to 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 do something. Um, you know, that's 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 really the policy question we have for you. It's safe to assume to use that a lot of a lot and or most of these spots don't have an existing traffic signal already, so there's not a pole there. It, I mean, is it possible safe to assume that these areas are dark because there's not a traffic signal? Uh, some of the places, I mean, like Staples, Staples Mill is probably the poster child, uh, for the kind of corridor we're talking about. It's dark. A lot of the signals don't have pedestrian signals and they don't have lighting. So, and you don't have business lighting on the outside. So that, that's kind of like a, a classic case. Um, gotcha. yep. All right. Well, Madam Chair, if I may, Bentley, you asked for some feedback. I'll, I'll give it to you. The creation of ongoing funding for infield development projects. I fully agree with the using of the credits. My, me personally, to assist with the connection fees during this window only. I agree with uh, the procurement of a second plumbing contact for the benefit of our citizens. No brainer. And the street light thing, I'm interested in for sure. Mr. Thornton's got a tremendous point. I, I think anybody would argue that if we can do it economically. And, it's feasible. I, I'm all in on that as well. So you asked your feedback. That's it. Outside of sanitary. And thank you for your work on the infill stuff that you've already done, including Rock Spring. There, there. That's a that's a good example of of being creative. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we're good.